Hello everyone, thank you for watching today. I'm excited to dive into Werner's cross-border freight solutions with you. And of course, to do that, we have an excellent guest with us. That's Lance Dixon, the Senior Vice President of Mexico, Canada, and Temperature Control Divisions over at Werner. Lance, thank you so much for joining us here so we can introduce the audience to everything that you're offering. Yeah, well, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure and I'm excited. Yeah, I, I'm very excited, especially, I mean, we're talking about nearshoring and everything that's coming to Mexico as well. I'm excited to dive into a lot of these offerings. I'm sure that you're seeing more and more people ask about as well. And if you could really provide us Werner's journey into this experience of providing cross-border freight solutions from your perspective, that would be great. Yeah, so I'll start from the beginning, I guess. So 1999 was the first year we pro uh, began providing cross-border services into Mexico. It all started with dry van through trailer service, which meant the trailer that loaded in Omaha, Nebraska was exactly the same trailer that unloaded in Mexico City. Uh, when we started, we started with uh, three associates, one office in Mexico City. Today, we've expanded to four offices inside of Mexico. So Mexico City, uh, Quietro, Guadalajara, and Monterrey. Two owned terminals along the border, that being Laredo and El Paso. And then we have four other drop yards uh, along the border, stretching from far Texas, Nogales, Arizona, Calexico, California, and, and San Diego. Uh, today, that group is 150 associates spread across the total of 10 different offices in Mexico and the United States. So you can see it's been quite a journey over the last 25 years. Uh, growth has been exceptional. Um, today, we, you know, we, as I mentioned earlier, we started with dry van cross border services and, and through trailer services. Today, that's expanded greatly. Today, we offer not only the dry van cross border services, but we do the same thing for temperature control or reefer business. We offer peer brokerage solutions. We offer uh, what we call power only solutions, which is a Warner trailer and then a non Warner tractor on the front of that. So those are kind of logistic solutions. We offer intermodal services out of Mexico and into Mexico. That's all like containers on trains, obviously. And then lastly, um, a fairly new service for us is, is what we call cross docking or transloading at the border at our facility in Laredo. We have a state of the art facility, um, about 20 doors or so, 10, of, 10 or so of those are committed to dry freight and about 10 to temperature control type of freight. So think food products, um, those sorts of things. So that I know that was quick. But that's a, that's a quick rundown of everything. Well, and it's, it's it's great to hear about those those milestones over the last twenty five years. I mean, it's of course we all know Warner and the the great domestic presence that you have, but to see this cross border aspect and the growth of it in particular, and especially, I mean, it's got to dive into it. But the challenges of of knowing that your freight is is going to be transloaded and taken off the truck, but knowing that there's one person behind it, one company behind it that you can trust is, I'm sure, brings a lot of that stress off of, of shippers as well. I want to talk about that. A lot of the challenges, right, that you encounter doing uh, cross-border business, what do those challenges look like? And, and how is Warner optimizing those operations to avoid those challenges and, and bring some really incredible opportunities to shippers as well? Yeah, you know, cross-border is very complex. There's a lot of intricate pieces that need to happen. It's, it's unique compared to domestic freight in the United States. And so the, it brings a whole new set of challenges. There's uh, specific paperwork that needs to be um, accompanying the load. Sometimes there's taxes or duties or fees that, that are need to be implemented on those products. There are um, different regulations in the U.S. versus Mexican law. So all of those nuances can create challenges for customers. You know, if I was on the other side of the table and I was a shipper, I'd be looking for a service provider um, that's experienced. You know, that's where Warner shines. We've got 25 years doing this, so we we don't practice any longer. We're experts. We're pros. We know what we're doing. That allows us to quickly solve problems that may be unforeseen, you know, things that come up. Most of the time, very rarely do we ever see a problem presented that we haven't seen in the past. And that experience allows us to quickly problem solve uh, we have relationships at the border. We have relationships with Mexican carriers, that relationship with our customer. All of those are super important to us. And that's what helps things flow seamlessly through that border quickly with, with you know, very few delays. Um, and so that's important to customers. And so that's what we do. 
Well, I want to, to talk about that aspect, right? You've did 25 years of this experience and, and from your own eyes as well. How are those, how are those challenges, how have they evolved over time, right? I, I'm sure uh, different regulatory problems come up. Like how, how do you diagnose those problems and, and look for solution, long-term solutions to, to try to avoid those for other customers as well? Yeah, it's ever changing. I mean, it's, it's a dynamic world and it should be, um, you know, um, NAFTA was written in uh, 1994. It was redone under the Trump administration, and it's now called USMCA. Um, quick snippet on that. USMCA is a much better document than, than NAFTA. It's still 80% NAFTA, but there's some nuances in there that uh, address things that never even existed in 1994. So, for example, uh, Amazon didn't exist. And so um, the new USMCA document addresses those sorts of things. So these challenges... Uh, are ever changing and it just it's dynamic so we just we need to keep up on them the the most recent is a document that the mexican government requires called carta porte and it uh, it's just the document that the mexican carriers need to submit to mexican customs prior to they get there that does create some challenges but just the partnership and relationship that we have with our mexican carriers and our customers is primarily what helps us solve these types of things uh, in a quick manner and uh, bringing them up to speed. So, for example, when, when Carte de Porte went into effect, you know, we worked with each of our shippers saying, hey, this is the new law, this is the new regulation, this is the new documents that you need to provide to the Mexican carrier so they can present them prior to the actual load reaching the border so they can pre-clear. Once it's pre-cleared, things really go really, really smoothly from that point. So it's just a, a relationship building that trust and that bond with our with not only the service providers in Mexico, but with our uh, customers. That's what solves most of these problems. Yeah, there's, you know, when it comes to to crossing borders and going through customs, right, you you don't want any any hiccups because that can delay you so for such a long time. And, and, and I think what's interesting too is over the years, right, with more and more trade, even customs themselves, it's like, listen, we want help. And that means clean documentation, working with people that you trust and, and people that understand those regulations. And like you said, uh, the dynamic changing of those as well. And, and that's really what I, I want to touch on here is for those watching, carriers and shippers alike, with the anticipated trends in nearshoring, what should people be mindful of when working uh, with cross-border trade in particular? Yeah, so I'll back up and I'll take nearshoring from the beginning. Um, so nearshoring is real. It's happening. It will take a full decade, I think, for it kind of to all play out. But we're in the early, early innings or early stages of nearshoring. So you look at foreign direct investment over the last two years in Mexico, and it's hit a record. So the monies are committed. Once the monies are committed, it takes some time to prop up a, a you know a shop or, or a facility to actually produce anything. They have to find a site. That takes a bit of time. Then they have to pull in infrastructure. So think roads, water, sewer, electric, uh, communication lines, all that sort of stuff. And some of this stuff happens simultaneously at the same time, but it still takes a bit of time. So then they have to physically get a structure up, get the building up, uh, and then they got to get the machinery inside, um, get it placed. And then lastly, they have to train uh, the shows, associates or workers that are going to work in that before anything ever comes out that back door. So best case scenario, that takes 18, 24 months. Now, there are some you know, some of our customers are obviously already in Mexico, already have facilities in Mexico. They can ramp up much quicker. They already have a facility. So what they'll do is they'll add a second shift or a third shift. And the really only ramp up they have is training those new associates for that second or third shift. So they can ramp pretty quickly. So that's kind of what we're seeing right now is, is customers that are doing that. And so the nearshoring thing is real. Uh, it's happening. Um, and it's going to be really interesting to see where this goes in the next uh, decade or so. Now, kind of back to your original question, which was, um, you know, what problems does this present um, for both customers and carriers, right? This, this creates a, an, an imbalance at the border. So a northbound, southbound imbalance with northbound outpacing the southbound. So customers need to be, I think, to be successful, they need to be open to possibly shipping in new modes that they don't presently do. So I, again, I would partner with a service provider that can uh, provide multiple service offerings. And so that's where Warner shines. 
that's, you know, we have, as I talked about already, we have the cross-border dry, we have cross-border TCU, we have pure brokerage, we have, uh, which is just basically logistics, brokering type of things. We have power only, we have intermodal, and we have cross-docking uh, capabilities. So, you know, the, these customers need to partner and look for service providers that have multiple service modes that they can provide. They have experience. Again, Warner's got 25 years experience. And then they need to find a service provider that also has size and scope that can grow with them as they start growing their volumes. If you're working with a small service provider, um, nothing against them, but they're small service providers. Um, If you're going to be shipping 40 loads, 50 loads a day, you're going to have to partner with a carrier that has the size and scope to be able to help um, you know, through those type of volumes. And, and as they work into peak, it even gets to be uh, more of a concern. And so if I, if, those are, if, I, if I was on the other side of the table, those are the things I'd be looking for, or those, and those would be the things I would be thinking about. Well, it's clear the expertise is there, and I want to thank you for your time and for everyone watching. You know, Make sure that you consider all of these problems when looking at cross-border trade and you consider Werner, of course, and the expertise that clearly Lance has displayed today. So thank you so much, so much, Lance, for all of your help and your expertise. Yeah, it's been my pleasure. I've had a good time today. So if you need anything, reach out.